Good morning, everybody. I'm Claudia Farias Benjamin, professor in the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. I'm the chair of the meeting, and I would like to welcome everybody. Uh, even in this hard and demanding time that we are living, we hold on and we decided to offer the third workshop on inflammation. I'm very happy and proud to make it. So we gathered um, several uh, national and international uh, outstanding researchers to share with us uh, their work and making this a nice and very interesting moment to discuss science. I think we need it in this time. So to make it possible, uh, I couldn't make it alone. So I would like to thank the organizing committee. Uh, we work together. So I would like to thank for uh, the time spent, uh, the work done, the support, the friendship. So this is only happening because we work together. We are, we are a team. And I would like to name all of them uh, now in the beginning of our event. So I have a list of the signs in the second monitor, so I'll give a quick look. But I would like to thank uh, Ana Carolina Oliveira, Bruno Dias, Claudia Lúcia, Martins, Cristiane Bandeira de Melo, Josiane Neves, Jorge Tributino, João Alfredo Moraes, Leonardo Travassos, Manuela Lanzetti, Marília Zaluar Guimarães e Rosane Viana Jorge. Thank you very much. I also want to thank FAPERG uh, for the financial support. Uh, the reason that this meeting is offering without charge, the registration is free of charge, is because we have a support. So I would like to thank very much for the support, Papesh. So uh, as I told you, this is the third event. We had, uh, we offered the first workshop on inflammation in 2011. The second uh, we offered in 2018. And we were supposed to, uh, to realize the third, to offer the third workshop on inflammation in 2020. However, uh, due to the pandemic of uh, COVID-19, we made some adjustments and we are just offering the, the third workshop on inflammation remotely uh, 2021. But the good news is that we're going to offer the fourth workshop on inflammation in 2022 in person, hopefully. And I hope to, to uh, realize the, to to offer this meeting in the in the tomorrow museum it would be great let's see and i would like to see all of you there so the reason that we are going to offer uh next year is because we planned that this congress would be biennial so we keep the plan and we are going to offer next year so i need to give some informations um the participants that uh, want the certificate um, uh, you need to attend 50% of the uh, sessions offered. So, and to validate uh, your presence, please uh, uh, capture the QR code that uh, uh, will be on the screen, or you can uh, click uh, on, uh, on the link below the video, okay? Uh, the next information is that uh, the parts, uh, people that are not registered yet, but still we have time, you can visit our, uh, our uh, site, workshoponinflammation.org, and make it, join us and follow the meeting. Okay, and the last, uh, almost the last, uh, the next uh, uh, information is that, uh, as you see, the meeting, the meeting is broadcast in YouTube and also in the Facebook. So uh, visit the site, give likes, make suggestions, comment. We would love to receive it, okay? So now the last information is that during the talks, you'll be able to make questions, comments, and the, the chair of the session will place your question to the speaker, okay? So I think I talk too much. Let's begin the, the meeting. Uh, I would like to thank the audience, also to thank Dr. Brown, our opening keynote, uh, to be here with us, to join us. It's a pleasure to have you here. So I'm going to uh, call Josiane. Uh, 
to introduce Dr. Brown. Hello, uh, everyone. My name is Josiane Sabadini Neves, and I will be the chair of this uh, section. As Claudia just uh, said, uh, uh, I'd like to thank all the audience, the, the speakers, the, the students, the uh, researchers for being here, uh, attending the, the, the workshop. Uh, I would also, uh, I would like to especially thank Dr. Gordon Brown for kindly accepting the invitation for this uh, meeting. Uh, let me say some words about uh, Dr. Uh, Brown to introduce uh, our special guest. Uh, Dr. Brown is the director of the MRC Center for Medical Mycology at the University of Exeter, uh, UK, and director of the Africa Medical Mycology Unit at the University of Cape Town. He obtained his PhD at the University of Cape Town, South Africa, and his postdoctoral training at the University of uh, Stellenbosch, also in South Africa, and then at the University of Oxford, UK, as a Wellcome Trust Fellow. Uh, in 2004, he returned to the University of Cape Town as a Wellcome Trust Senior Fellow to establish his group. Uh, in 2009, he moved to the University of Aberdeen, UK, where he uh, established the MRC Center for Medical Mycology, which was in 2019 relocated to the University of Exeter. Um, Dr. Brown uh, is a fellow of the Royal Society, Academy of Medical Science, Royal Society of Edinburgh, and Royal Society of South Africa. Uh, so far in, reser in research, he has made many contributions in the field of C-type lectin receptors and their role in homeostasis and immunity, which are particular focus on antifungal uh, immunity. So it's my pleasure to introduce our, our opening keynote, Dr. Gordon Brown. So welcome, Dr. Gordon Brown, so, and thank you. Josiane, well, thank you very much. Can I just confirm you can hear me fine and everything is running well? Yes. Right, very well, nice. thank you. Thank you. Well, th thank you, Josiane and Claudia and the other organizers uh, for inviting me to give you this uh, talk and this presentation at the opening of your meeting. And I wish you a good meeting. It looks very exciting. You have a very nice pro program. So um, as Josiane mentioned to you, my, my research interest is really focused around one group of receptors, the C-type lectins. You can see by my title that they regulate inflammation. And actually, the C-type lectin receptors are a really understudied and underappreciated group of molecules that I would always argue are absolutely central to all of immunity. But what I want to do in my talk today is to really emphasize uh, three points about these receptors. First of all, that they play very important in regulating inflammation. Mostly of what I'm going to talk to you about today will be their roles in driving inflammatory responses. I'm not going to be talking too much about how they regulate, negatively regulate inflammatory responses, but there's increasing evidence that they play very important roles in that aspect too. Secondly, I want to point out that we still don't know a great deal about these receptors, and I'm going to share with you a main part of my work today that we're focusing on, uh, about a receptor that is operating in ways that we hadn't previously anticipated, and we don't still fully understand how it's functioning. And then finally, in, in the last few minutes of my talk, I want to point out that these receptors, like all molecules in immunity, do not act alone. And in actual fact, it's their interactions uh, with other receptors and other pathways that are very key uh, to the outputs that they give in terms of regulation, whether it be both positive uh, and negative. So uh, let me start uh, by um, reminding you about the C-type lectin receptor family of molecules. As I mentioned to you, these molecules, I would argue, are absolutely essential for um, all aspects of immunity. In fact, they're essential components of us being multicellular organisms because these molecules are involved in cellular migration. They form components of your extracellular matrix. They allow us to breathe in the lungs. Molecules such as the surfactant proteins are key molecules that are involved in regulating this. Now, as I mentioned, this is an enormous family. Uh, they are all uh, unified by the presence of one or more of these Pac-Man like structures, these C-type lectin-like domains uh, that traditionally were thought to recognize carbohydrates, hence the name lectin. Uh, 
and to recognize carbohydrates in a calcium dependent manner, hence the term C type lectin. Uh, uh, this has now been recognized uh, to be true for many of these molecules, but not true for all. And in fact, many of these C type lectin receptors, as they call, actually recognize a very diverse range of ligands, um, stretching uh, from um, proteins to lipids, for example. Now, where my interest in these molecules uh, comes in really is in this group of receptors you see down here, the ones that are at the cell surface. And the reason why these receptors are of such interest uh, to me and my group and, and others in the field is these molecules act as what we term traditional pattern recognition receptors, as you know, in immunity, where we have uh, receptors that have extracellular domains that enable them to interact with pathogens that either have uh, integral, in other words, direct, or associate with uh, intracellular domains uh, that uh, trigger intracellular signaling. And this means that this, upon recognition of pathogens by these domains, that signal can be in transduced inside the cell uh, and lead to a cellular and ultimately an immunological response. Now, the group of receptors that we're most interested in, as I mentioned, are these receptors, because these receptors have been shown uh, to recognize a very diverse range uh, of pathogens. So this is an old slide you can see down here. But in actual fact, this slide, I like to use it because it really clearly represents just how diverse groups of pathogens uh, are recognized by these receptors. Viruses, fungi, bacteria, parasites, for example. What is also shown in this slide, and I'm just gonna make this one reference to it again, is that these receptors can also recognize endogenous ligands, self ligands, like DNGR, which recognizes actin. Um, and this is an area of increasing interest, the ability of these receptors to not only recognize pathogens, but also self molecules and trigger the regulation of inflammation. Now, my group is interested in many aspects of these receptors, and we study them in many pathogen contexts. Uh, but as you heard uh, from Josie Ann, our primary interest really is in their role in uh, antifungal immunity. And the reason for this is that these receptors uh, recognize all the carbohydrate ligands that are present uh, in a fungal cell wall. So this is a, a, a diagrammatic representation uh, of a fungal cell wall uh, that really highlights the complexity and varied nature of the carbohydrates that are found in a variety of uh, uh, fungal species. But underlying all of this complexity are numbers of molecules that are very uniformly found in all fungi. And in examples of this, things like chitin, glucans, beta-glucan in particular, and mannan. And why these molecules are of such interest uh, to the immune system is that they are comprise structures that are not present uh, in our own uh, bodies and therefore act as perfect uh, path pathogen-associated molecular patterns. And indeed, the receptors that we have uh, described to date by and large recognize these components, and it's the recognition of these carbohydrates that triggers uh, the cellular responses. What also is particularly interesting about these lectins, as I mentioned, is that they trigger intracellular signaling that dictates cellular and immunological responses. In fact, it seems that many of these receptors, if not most of them, the activating ones at least, all signal uh, intracellularly through a now well-characterized pathway, but then when it was first discovered, very unique pathway involving this kinase SICK, which uh, binds to uh, tyrosine-based motifs uh, in the cytoplasmic tails of these receptors initiating a signaling cascade uh, through this adapter card nine that ultimately has a wide and varied uh, response, as I say, both at the cellular level uh, as well as the immunological level, and some of those are, are listed uh, below. But the reason why we know that these receptors are absolutely critical for controlling uh, fungal infections is because defects in these receptors but particularly defects in this downstream adapter that unifies all these receptors, renders individuals incredibly susceptible to fungal infections. And in fact, if you look at the toll-like receptor mutants in humans in terms of their central signaling molecules, they don't show a predisposition to fungal infections. It's really this CARD9 adapter that's turning out to be the most important uh, adapter uh, downstream of these receptors uh, that's important for controlling fungal infection, really highlighting this pathway is in a key an essential mechanism uh, for antifungal immunity. Now, it's important for me just to highlight just very briefly why it's important to study fungal infections, because of all pathogenic diseases, fungi or the, the impact of fungi on human morbidity and mortality is the least recognized, and they're the most understudied and underfunded group of infectious diseases 
uh, compared to bacteria and viruses, for example. And so this slide really is to highlight the impact that fungi have uh, on humans and to really highlight the scary statistics uh, that um, are presented by this group of pathogens. So we know that a quarter of the world's population suffer from fungal infections every year. Most of these infections are very benign infections, thrush, dandruff, skin infections like athlete's foot, for example. But of much greater concern are the life-threatening systemic infections that occur in millions of people every year. And what's particularly scary about these infections is that they have mortality rates uh, exceeding 50%. This is some of the highest mortality rates of any pathogen. And in fact, if you look at the total number of deaths that occur every year, excuse me, you can see that fungal infections have, or have about 1.6 million deaths every year, which is on par to the number of deaths that's caused by tuberculosis, and at least three times more than is caused uh, by uh, malaria. So clearly these, uh, these pathogens have a huge and enormous impact on human mobility and mortality. Most of these life-threatening and systemic infections are caused by four species of fungi, Aspergillus, Candida, Crypto, and Pneumocystis. And between them, these four account for about 95% uh, of these uh, total deaths. But of course, there are many other pathogens uh, that can cause uh, uh, lethal disease. Now, in order to combat these um, uh, infections, we have identified three major challenges that we need to address. We need better drugs. I think anyone could argue in pretty much all fields that that is the case, but in the antifungal community, we have a very limited arsenal compared to antibiotics for bacteria and anti antiviral drugs, for example. Many of the drugs, <coughs> excuse me, that we have uh, don't kill the pathogen. They merely uh, act in a static fashion and they're also extremely toxic. A part of that reason is because of course, fungi are eukaryotic pathogens and therefore very similar to ourselves. And so there's, we need better antifungal drugs if we are able to combat these diseases. We also need to be able to diagnose these pathogens better. So a lot of the mortality statistics that I presented to you in the last slide occur because the time that the patients are diagnosed actually with an invasive fungal infection, it's too late. And we've had very limited scope for really rapid, accurate diagnostics. This is starting to change. We now have uh, the development of um, lateral flow assays like you would have for COVID, for example, that are really starting to show great promise in treating and detecting diseases like Cryptococcus and more latterly uh, Aspergillus. But still diagnostics for things like Candida and others are, are really behind and we, and we need more. The third main challenge that we face, and this is the area that I work in, is really understanding the underlying immunology and pathology of fungal infections. Now, what I didn't tell you in the last slide is that most of these in, uh, people who die from fungal infections have actually compromised immune system. And, and the rise of fungal infection is a relatively uh, modern phenomenon due to modern medical interventions that cause immunosuppression, transplantation, cancer, for example, and of course, also HIV AIDS. And they, the idea behind this is that if we can have a better understanding of the underlying protective mechanisms of antifungal immunity, we can use that to develop adjunctive immunotherapeutic approaches. Now, just the last point to make here is why is it that we haven't really progressed in these uh, in the same state that other other uh, pathogens have progressed? And it's really the lack of funding and the lack of basic science and clinical interest. We really have a very big capacity problem in antifungal immunity, and that's part of the reason why we've created this MRC center. Uh, in uh, um, in Exeter, and we are planning in the future to uh, create a unit in, in Brazil as well, but we can talk about that later for to, to really try and promote research um, and training in medical mycology. But I digress. Let me get back to the topic of my talk, which is really the understanding of immunology and getting back to the C-type lectin receptors, which I've already alluded to, play a very important role uh, in combating a fungal disease. So what do these receptors do? I've mentioned that they're able to trigger intracellular signaling, and I've mentioned some of these activities. Let me focus in on Dectin-1. So this is a molecule that I discovered many years ago with Simon Gordon, and for which is the best characterized uh, receptor and its role in antifungal immunity. So this is a, a list of some of the responses, some recent, some old, that have been ascribed to Dectin-1 recognition of fungal pathogens and induction of immune responses, so it's a cellular and immune responses. So we know, for example, that Dectin-1 can trigger particle uptake by phagocytosis. It in induces the production of inflammatory lipids and inflammatory cytokines and chemokines. It induces important antimicrobial effector mechanisms like the respiratory burst and the formation of neutral extracellular traps 
And as part of his ability to activate um, pro-inflammatory cytokines like IL-1, uh, Dectin-1 and other C-tablectins have been shown directly to drive inflammasome activation, either directly through a CARD9 mechanism that was described by Theo Gettenbeck and indirectly through other less well-characterized mechanisms. But very importantly, like the toll-like receptors, activation of these C-type lectins and the triggering of these pathways and the cytokines they produce help direct the development of adaptive immunity. And C-type lectins have been shown to play a role in many arms of adaptive immunity, but most importantly, they've been shown to drive both Th1 and Th17 immunity. And this is key for controlling fungal infections. Th1 critical for controlling systemic infections, such as with cryptococcus. And Th17, as I'm sure you are aware, very important for controlling fungal infections at the mucosa. And in fact, in humans, any alteration in any aspect of the Th17 pathway predisposes individuals uh, to fungal infections uh, at mucocutaneous barriers, really highlighting the importance of this arm of the adaptive immune system uh, in controlling fungal infection. Now, of course, it's very easy to see a list of this uh, um, responses that a receptor like this can induce. But what I like to do is I like to show these videos because to me, even though we've made these videos nearly 20 years ago, this really highlights to me just how amazing these small receptors and how um, impactful they can be in terms of innate immune recognition of fungi. So on the left-hand side here, you can see is an RW macrophage cell on it we use in the lab. And this cell does not express lectin-1. And you can see very clearly uh, that this receptor, uh, sorry, that these cells are interacting uh, with these particles, but are not responding in any fashion uh, to these fungal particles when added uh, to, to the culture. But if we take exactly the same cell now and transduce it to express um, Dectin-1, you can see an absolutely fundamental and remarkable change in the ability of these cells to recognize and respond uh, to these particles. You can see active phagocytosis going on. These cells become avidly uh, uh, phagocytic, and they respond in that long list of, of, of um, cellular responses that I described to you in the last slide. These cells are inducing the respiratory burst, they're producing cytokines and chemokines. Really quite remarkable for the ability of just one small receptor. Now, at the cellular level, this is amazing enough. So you can imagine at the whole organism level that these um, um, receptors play a key role, and indeed we showed many years ago now, that in the absence of Dectin-1, if you did a systemic infection in mice, for example, with candida, you can see that the knockout mice show far more susceptibility to the infection than the wild-type mice. Uh, and the reason why these mice uh, succumb to the infection is because the loss of Dectin-1 causes defective uptake and killing, it causes defective inflammatory responses, and it causes um, a defective induction of the appropriate adaptive immune response. And with Mia Hanatea, we've gone on to show uh, that humans who have defects in Dectin-1, and this has also now been shown in other contexts, also show a predisposition uh, to particularly mucocutaneous infections uh, with candida. Now, one of the important things that I forgot to highlight earlier on that I'll just highlight here is that these receptors play primary, are known to play their primary functions on myeloid cells, macrophages, neutrophils, and dendritic cells. And you can imagine that this is critically important because these are the cells that are essential for controlling, innate immune cells that are essential for controlling uh, fungal infections, and you can imagine that these would be very important on the dritic cells, as has been shown, uh, in the importance of driving uh, adaptive immunity. And so what I want to share with you now is a new receptor that we have discovered that is completely changing the way uh, we are thinking about the role, how these receptors can function uh, in immunity, and particularly uh, in antifungal immunity. So as a few slides ago, I showed you this slide which describes the complex layer of uh, the fungal cell wall and all the various complex carbohydrate structures. But actually, there are a variety of other structures that are present for which we know can drive immune responses, but for which the receptors are not uh, well known. For example, melanin, the pigment melanin, which is actually not carbohydrate, uh, GXM, galactomannan, and alpha-glucans, for example. And so the receptor that I want to tell you about is a receptor we just discovered about two or three years ago now called MALLEC. And we discovered this somewhat gratuitously. Uh, we have a program in my lab, or we had a program in my lab, where we would take the extracellular domain of C-type lectins and then fuse them to a, uh, the FC region of a human immunoglobulin molecule. Um, this allows us to have like a probe, like an antibody probe, essentially, except the, the, the variable region, in this case, is the C-type lectin domain, which we can then use to probe uh, various pathogens and ligands to see if they're binding anything. So we took this molecule, uh, MAL, which we call MALLEC,
And we discovered that it recognizes the spore form of vespigens, canidial form of vespigens. But when these spores germinated, uh, the ligand was lost. So you can see malic staining here in red and a control protein not staining. And this is better uh, visualized when you look at um, the canidia uh, or the spores. So you can see very nice staining of this uh, probe on the spores in these patchy punctate fashion on the spores of the canidia. But when they sell, swell and germinate, the, the ligand is lost. Now, as I mentioned, aspergillus is one of the big four. So we were very excited to have discovered a receptor that seemed to recognize this pathogen. Just to focus in a little bit on aspergillus, so it causes a variety of diseases, none of which are very good. The invasive form is the most scary uh, fungal disease you can get. So if you're a transplant patient and you get an, an invasive aspergillus disease, on average, you've only got about a 20% chance of survival. In other words, 80% of people who get an invasive aspergillus disease will die from that infection. It also causes complications such as chronic pulmonary diseases, which complicates things like uh, COPD, tuberculosis, for example. And of course, uh, uh, aspergillus and other fungi are, have been linked to allergy and allergy-related diseases, which can affect millions of people every year. So having discovered a receptor that recognizes this pathogen uh, was particularly exciting. So what is it recognizing? And that was the first question that we asked. Now, we assumed it was going to be a carbohydrate. Actually, it turned out not to be a carbohydrate. It turned out to be fungal melanin. And the clue for that we discovered. So this punctate staining, as you can see that I showed you already, was very reminiscent of uh, this uh, structure that had been described in this paper. And it was described that these nodules were actual fact were melanin sticking out through the surface uh, of the, the spore. And so we got hold of a, of a uh, mutant of, of aspergillus from Axel Brockhager in Vienna in Germany, this PKSP mutant, where there's a defect in the biosynthetic pathway right at the beginning of the pathway of melanin. And you can see very clearly here by this um, immunofluorescence microscopy, but also by flow cytometry, that when you stain uh, with this FC mutant, pro this FC fusion protein, that the staining and recognition is completely lost in spores that lack melanin. And so uh, the melanin biosynthetic pathway is actually very well uh, characterized. It's been done by work in Jun Kong Chong at the NIH. And basically what we did was we took mutants uh, in every single step of this biosynthetic pathway. And you can see that where you lose recognition is really at this very first step. So this is the key molecule that's being recognized by melanin, by malolec. Uh, it's this heptaketone natapyrin or YWA1. It's not a carbohydrate. Uh, and so it's recognizing this very small molecule. And this is something we're particularly interested in. How does a molecule uh, like malolec recognize um, such a small molecule? And what does this mean in terms of uh, biosynthetic products from other fungi? So this DHN melanin pathway is in effect found in other fungi, not all fungi. Fungi have a variety of flavors of melanin synthesis. But all fungi that have a DHN melanin pathway, we have shown, uh, are recognized by this receptor. And that's where it got its name from, melanin recognizing uh, lectin. So that was the first surprise, that this was a, a, a C-type lectin that did not recognize a fungal carbohydrate, but recognized another component uh, of these pathogens. Where is it expressed? So as you would imagine, for a pathogen that can affect pulmonary function, this receptor is very well expressed in the lung. And you can see this by flow cytometry, uh, but also by immunofluorescence microscopy. You can see this is a control. You can see very interesting staining of this receptor quite broadly in the lung tissues of this mouse. Now, this was, staining is very unusual because you can see it forms this very punctate fashion that we hadn't seen before with other lectins. See, lectin 1, for example, is expressed pretty uniformly around uh, a cell. And that's something that we've been working on uh, that's ongoing work in my lab. It turns out that this receptor forms these large multimeric complexes at the surface whose function we don't yet know. But nevertheless, it's very interesting. So this is that punctate staining pattern that I showed in the last slide. This is now in a transfected cell. Again, you see these really large patchy uh, expression of the receptor. And then if you run this out in a Western blot, so this is a, a C type lectin dectin 1. You can see it's not a, it's expressed as a monomer. This is a dimeric C type lectin that I won't talk about called Mikkel. You can see under reducing conjunction, it's reduced. But you can see malic forms these huge multimeric oligomeric structures which appears to be uh, reduction resistant, in, at least in terms of the dimer formation. So what is the function of this biologically? We don't know. Uh, we're busy working quite hard to understand the structural and functional components of this receptor and how, what this means in terms of its cellular function. So what cells is this receptor expressed on? Now, like, like I mentioned, Dectin-1 and other c type lectins involved in antifungal immunity are expressed on myeloid cells. But here was the next surprise. 
Malnac is not expressed on myeloid cells at all. So here's a fluorescent cytometric standing looking at these, this population in lung that I've already shown you. And we get it on CD45, the marker of myeloid cells. And you can see very clearly that this receptor is not expressed on myeloid cells at all in mice. Now, we looked very, very hard to see whether it was expressed. And we have never seen expression of this receptor on any myeloid population in any tissue we've ever looked. But where you do see expression is on the CD45 negative population, the non-myeloid cells, which when we broke it down in, into some detail, looking at a variety of markers, we saw that these were expressed on CD31 endothelial cells. So this is the endothelial population, EPCAM negative or epithelial cells. And when you look at the CD31 negative cells, EPCAM positive cells, these are the epithelial cells, this receptor is not expressed. So it seems to be expressed predominantly on endothelial cells. But when we took the mouse uh, and we broke it down into its component parts, what we found was that only in the lung and the liver, we have detected another population of cells, one that's not been reported previously and whose function is still unclear, a population of cells that express both the endothelial marker CD31 uh, and the epithelial marker EPCAM. And you can see that very clearly here. But this is only found, as I said, uh, in the lung and the liver. And the function of these cells uh, is unclear. So again, this is something that was completely unexpected. A C-type lectin receptor that recognized fungi, but recognizing fungi and being expressed on a cell type uh, that's not traditionally associated with innate immune uh, recognition of fungi. Now, I just want to tell you one very quick aside, because this is something we learned the hard way in studying uh, these sort of uh, analyses. So we were looking at, at mal lac expression uh, in lung tissue and in a whole lot of other organs. Uh, but we also started looking at dectin-1 expression in those tissues as well, because we obviously wanted controls to compare myeloid cells, non-myeloid cells. And this is work that was just recently published. It was led by Mark Stuppers doing the enzymatic dissociation. And it's just a really quick comment. What we've discovered is that certain pattern recognition receptors are extremely sensitive uh, to the enzymes that you use to, 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 to digest tissues. So if this is something you're doing in your lab, be aware of this. Here's an example of it shown below. Just focus on the right. So this is the lung dissociation kit that we used actually turned out to be fine. So if you look at dectin-1 expression, the red is uh, um, uh, normal tissue that's not been an enzymatic attached. This has been mechanically disrupted versus uh, tissue that's been uh, enzymatically disassociated for analysis shown in blue. And what you can see very clearly is that many of these enzymes that you use have significant effects on expression on pattern recognition receptors, or c lectin expression. For example, elastase and display is completely cleave off dectin-1 off the surface of the cell. And this is true for other lectins. If you're interested in more details, I'll point you to that paper. But just a point to take home. The way you analyze these tissues uh, is very important. Okay, so getting back to the malolac story. So what is this receptor doing? So we made a malolac knockout mouse. That's just to prove to you that population of positive cells has gone in the knockouts. And the first experiment we did was to um, do a uh, infection in these mice, modeling systemic infection, like the invasive disease. I told you it has such high mortality in those patients who are immune compromised. And so what you can see very clearly that when we do that in the wild type versus knockout mice, that the malolac knockout mice show an incredibly increased susceptibility uh, to the infection uh, using this challenge model compared to the wild type animals. And what was really nice is that we were able to show that this is absolutely dependent on the presence of melanin in the canidia, because when you took this melanin deficient mutant, now you can see that the susceptibility of the mice is equivalent between the wild type and the knockout. So clearly, Malik is sensing melanized uh, aspergillus in this model and it's playing a role in driving protective immune response. And when you lose the protective immune response, you get increased susceptibility. So why are the mice dying? So we did this the same sort of experiment now where we actually stopped the, the experiment just before all the mice died to have a look at what's going on in the tissues. And what we saw was that there was uncontrolled fungal growth in all the tissues we looked at. So here's the brain, liver, and kidney. We can clearly see that the fungus is going, getting out of control in these tissues. Um, and that's correlating with, um, whoops, wrong way, correlating with an increased inflammatory response uh, in, these, um, in these mice, looking at, for example, at the brain. So malolac is absolutely required to control fungal outgrowth. And when this happens, uh, when you lose malolac, you get a fungal outgrowth and you get a massive inflammatory response. And this can perhaps very well visualized in this immunofluorescent microbiome of the brain. You're not supposed to have fungi in the brain, as you can imagine. So these are mice, malolac deficient mice. And you can see uh, fungi in the brain, massive inflammatory response. And we believe it's this massive inflammatory response that's ultimately causing 
uh, the increased mortality in these animals. So male lake is clearly playing a very important role uh, in regulating that. So what about humans? Uh, um, we tend to use mouse models, but one of the things that we always do is always try and translate what we discover in mice uh, into human uh, studies. So we did the same thing again. We made a human version of this where we cloned out the human uh, CTAP lectin domain. And then we uh, characterized the receptor in the same way. And we could show exactly the same thing, that the human male also able to recognize um, spores of aspergillus fumigators. And this is dependent upon the melanin again, because if you have a mutant that lacks the melanin, the PKSP, you can see that recognition is gone. So clearly, this is also a receptor that is able to recognize, um, the human receptor is also able to recognize fungal melanin. And then in collaboration with Augustino Cavaglio, who is a very large cohort of stem cell transplant patients, we were able to identify a relatively common SNP allele uh, in uh, the patient population, uh, which conferred a hugely increased susceptibility uh, in, uh, uh, in patients that receive bone marrow containing uh, the SNP. Now, you can see some incongruence because I've just told you that Malek is expressed on non-myeloid cells in mice. In human, there's evidence now that it is expressed in myeloid cells. So there is a peer, a peer, um, apparently a contribution of myeloid cell function of Malek uh, in humans. But the take-home message from this is that Malek is really important for controlling invasive fungal disease, both in humans uh, and in mice. So one of the questions we're currently asking is, uh, what is the SNP allele doing? It's, it's not a stop allele. It just causes a, a, this change, as you can see now, which is actually in the in the cytoplasmic tail, shall I say, uh, of the receptor. And when we took patient cells from, 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 from these uh, individuals, we could show that there was differences in inflammatory responses. But one of the interesting discoveries that we've just made, so this is really hot off the press data, we've discovered that this dimerization, this multimerization that I mentioned to you, just focusing on the reduced plot here, you can see that there's a really big difference in the ability of this uh, mutant or SNP, mutant SNP or alt allele uh, to form these high order complexes. So clearly the structure of this receptor at the cell surface is key to its function. And that's something that we're trying to investigate. I don't have the answer for you now. So that really goes to show that this receptor is key, critically important for controlling uh, invasive disease. But I mentioned to you that this uh, aspergillus causes a variety of other diseases in humans. And the one that we were particularly interested in considering the role of this receptor of malic in the lung was its role in allergy. Now, you know, of course, that fungi have been linked to, to, to asthma in many contexts, and fungi are thought to play being very important drivers for the development of allergic responses, and have been associated, sensitization with fungi has been associated with severe forms of, of, uh, of asthma. And so I had a pulmonary physician scientist come into my lab for, for two years. This was Kazuya Tone, who's since returned to Japan and just to carry on on this project uh, in, in, at home, who set up this uh, sensitization and challenge model so that we could look to see whether Malek was playing a role uh, in, um, in allergic responses to fungi. So the model that uh, Kazuya used is a standard model of uh, fungal sensitization and challenge where you sensitize the mice twice and you let the mice sit and develop an adaptive immune response, and then you come in and you challenge them, cull them, and then look at the resultant immune response. Now, from the data that I've just shown you, Malnick is very important for controlling uh, invasive disease. Now, one of the first things that we noticed in this model is that none of the, none of the knockout mice died, after, even after repeated intratracheal challenges uh, with this um, pathogen. That's perhaps not surprising. It's very difficult to kill an otherwise healthy mouse through uh, pulmonary uh, installation of, um, of, of spores or aspergillus. But we also expected it to play a very important role in, in, in the development of disease. But what we found was actually completely opposite to what we expected. What we found was that the loss of malic was actually protective in this model. So now what we're doing is we're monitoring the weight change of the mice. So this is a large group of animals in each study. This was pooled data from many experiments. Each of these green lines uh, indicate when the mice received uh, challenges of the canidia. And you can see very clearly that the wild type mice, they are clearly suffering from this allergic challenge model. They're not putting on any weight. And whenever you challenge the mice, they tend to show a decrease in weight. The knockout mice, on the other hand, seem to be very largely unaffected by this uh, regime. And in fact, if you compare the weight growth of the knockout mice to animals that were just um, receiving PBS alone, there's no difference between the knockout. I haven't shown you that yet, but essentially the knockout mice show no effect uh, of um, 
this challenge model in terms of their overall physiology measured by weight change, whereas the wild type mice do. Now, what was really amazing was that if you took those knockout mice at this time point and then looked at the fungal burdens, there was these mice, despite the fact not showing any abnormal physiological response, were showing greatly enhanced uh, fungal burdens uh, in their lung tissues. This is amazing, isn't it? Because you've got a, a mouse with very high fungal burdens in their lungs, but actually protected physiologically uh, from uh, the effects of this model. And this, this model, I just point out, required uh, live fungal spores, because if you did it with heat killed, both the wild type and the knockout showed yeah, equal, no, no effect. So clearly the inflammatory response or something that's going on in, the, in, in, in these mice is altered uh, in the knockouts, and that this is giving a protective phenotype, but at the same time, and correlating with what we had described through the other model, uh, loss of uh, fungal outgrowth. But this fungal outgrowth was not having any overt detrimental effects. So when we looked at the lungs of these animals by, um, by histology, we could very clearly see that there was a difference in an inflammatory response between the wild type and the knockout. So just focusing on this top row here, these are the wild type mice stained with H&E and the male lake knockout. And then we've characterized the inflammation area and the bronchial, bronchial thickness. The important point is I think visually you can very easily see that there's a massively higher inflammatory response in the wild type mice. Uh, that is uh, much reduced uh, in the malolactic uh, knockout mice. Now, one of the aspects of an allergic response, of course, is a TH2 cytokine response uh, that is characterized by a variety of things, either xenophilia, but in, in allergy models, also by goblet cell hyperplasia. And what we looked, when we looked at goblet cell hyperplasia in these mice, you could see that although the inflammation was greater in the wild type mice than the malolactic mice, goblet cell hyperplasia, which is indicated by this pink staining here, was actually equivalent, and you can see we scored it over there. So that suggested that the allergic response that was occurring in these mice was in the malic mice was equivalent to the wild type, but that the overall inflammatory response uh, was reduced. And indeed, when we went and then characterized the inflammatory response in these mice using flow cytometry, we could see, as you've just seen in this previous slide, there were far fewer cells. Uh, but this translated primarily into a difference in neutrophils coming into the lungs, whereas a TH2 allergic response in both the wild types and the knockout was equivalent. So what we were seeing here, in fact, what it, what it suggested was that the, the, the malolactic knockout mice were controlling, uh, well, the malolactic is responsible for controlling inflammation and playing a role in driving neutrophilic responses, uh, but that malolactic was not involved in controlling or regulating uh, the development of the allergic response me by measuring uh, eosinophils uh, or um, goblet cell hyperplasia. And indeed, we went on to show, looking at cytokines, I'm not going to show you that data, uh, that that's, this was true, that there was alterations in neutrophil cytokine, neutrophil associated cytokines, uh, but not alterations in TH2 associated cytokines. Um, we went on then to look at the T cell response, because this defect in the neutrophil response suggested there's a defect in the development of TH17 responses. And indeed, that's exactly what we found. I'll just uh, get to that quite quickly. You can see that there's reduced T cells, but this defect in T cells is primarily associated with uh, reduced TH17 type response, uh, looking at raw gamma T positive T cells as well as IL-17 positive T cells. And again, just to highlight this point, uh, if you look at CATA3 or IL-4 producing T cells, TH2 T cells, in other words, there's no difference uh, between the wild type and the knockouts. So what this is telling us is that this receptor is a really unique receptor that's unusually expressed on non myeloid cells, it's expressed on endothelial cells. It recognizes a, a, a unique ligand, DHN melanin, a non carbohydrate ligand. It's clearly involved in regulating inflammatory responses to in, in vivo. This, these, this regulation is involved in controlling disseminated inf infection and fungal outgrowth in, in all settings. Uh, but it seems to have an important regulatory phenotype in allergic responses uh, to aspergillus. So the, so the big question uh, that remains is, well, how the hell is this receptor doing this? How is this receptor mediating all of these effects when it's expressed on a non myeloid phenotype? Now, it's got a, I'll show you this diagram here, and you can see it's got the cytoplasmic tail, and I bet you're thinking, well, yeah, it's like Dectin 1 or others, it's associating with sick. It doesn't associate with sick. We've looked very extensively at the signaling pathway of this receptor, even artificially when we expressed it in myeloid cells. It does not associate with sick. We don't know how this receptor is doing it. And so the big question for us is what is this receptor doing and how it's doing? How is it doing it? 
So I can show you some of the things that we've learned, some of it's published, some of it's not published. So the first thing is we know it senses melanin. So I've shown you that this receptor binds melanin, um, and we've done that uh, in a variety of fashions. This is another way. So basically what we do here is we create a, a cell line report system where we take the extracellular domain of the c type lectin of interest, in this case, NALEC, and then we fuse it to a known signaling domain in a cell that has a reporter system that, that we can see when this signaling domain is activated. In other words, if this receptor is recognizing something, it'll trigger a signal that we can measure. And that's exactly what we see. So this is measuring IL-2 output in this reporter cell, it's a PWZ cells. And we've got some controls here. Uh, if we cross-link cross the receptor with an antibody, which actively drives us, we see a very nice IL-2 production. And then if we add in uh, melanized canidia, you can see there's a dose response uh, of this receptor to these canidia. And this doesn't occur when you have this, the, the canidia that lack melanin. So clearly this receptor is sensing the melanin. This is not a surprise, I've already told you this. But we wondered, well, perhaps what this receptor is doing is it's acting like dectin one, like in that video I showed you. It's tethering the particles to the surface and mediating uh, their internalization. So we looked at this in a variety of ways. I'm going to show you what to do here. So this is the flow symmetric assay where we measure this. So basically what we do is we have a labeled particle uh, and we have ways of, of detecting it. Uh, this, in this case, it's fluorescently labeled xylazan, but it would have also been a fluorescently labeled canidia. This is just showing you dectin one. This is positive control. You can see that when you add in fluorescently labeled xylazan, the cells, we can detect the cells that can bind uh, these particles. And so if we go then to, to these figures over here, so uh, pink is uh, dectin one and blue is malac. And you can see when we add in xylazan, this is the particle with beta glucan, no melanin. Very clearly, dectin one is able to recognize these particles. That makes sense. And malac does not bind these particles. That makes sense too, because there's no melanin. But if we take a canidia particle, which does have melanin, but also has beta glucan, dectin one binds. Great. But surprisingly, malac doesn't bind. So this receptor is not acting like a tethering receptor. And in fact, many of the toll like receptors function in an, in an analogous fashion. They do not have the ability to tether the organisms to the cell surface, but they are able to sense their components. And so we think malac is, is acting. Uh, like a, a tethering, uh, sorry, a sensing receptor on cells, but does not act like a tethering receptor. Now, one of the possibilities is that perhaps malac contributes to tethering. Maybe on cells, it has there are other receptors, and malac can contribute to that. We looked at that in quite extensively. We could never find any evidence for that. But actually, the proof of the pudding that this receptor is not a tethering receptor or involved in, in canidial binding was when we went back to our in vivo model. And so what we did here was we uh, infected mice. Uh, with uh, canidia four hours later, so these are labeled canidia. Four hours later, we then pulled out the endothelial cells, the CD31 cells, and we looked for association of canidial particles with the endothelial cells uh, by flow cytometry that's shown over here. And you can see very clearly in the numbers of animals that we looked at, there is no difference in the number of particles binding to the endothelial cells in the malic uh, knockout mice. So clearly, this is a sensing receptor, not a tethering receptor. And so that leads us with a conundrum that we're currently working on now. We're doing our uh, RNA-seq approaches in a variety of different manners, trying to understand, well, if it's sensing the pathogen, what is the signals that it's giving to the endothelial cells that are having such an enormous impact uh, on the regulation of information that we see both in the systemic model, but also in the allergic model. And that's an answer that we are moving towards uh, going forward. So um, just to, to remind you, so this was the second point that I wanted to make. In fact, the first and second points that I wanted to make in my talk, that these C-type lectins are very important for regulating inflammation, but there are still many secrets about these receptors that we don't yet understand. And this story that I've told you so far uh, was the key component um, that is opening our eyes to new ways in which lectins, C-type lectins can play roles uh, in uh, immunity. So of course, we focus primarily on, on uh, Aspergillus in this case, but presumably there are other lectins doing other things for other pathogens on these cells, and that's something that we are looking for as well. So the last point that I want to make in the in the last ten minutes or so, maybe less of my talk, is to go back to this this concept that 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 we look at receptors uh, by themselves, but we don't factor in the fact that these receptors actually work in concert with multiple other receptors uh, on the cell surface. So I showed you the slide, uh, many slides ago now, uh, of the ability of these receptors to recognize multiple pathogens. Of course, if you look at it from the pathogen perspective, these pathogens have multiple PAMs that are recognized by many receptors. 
And in actual fact, it's the integrated response between CTARP, lectin receptors, integrins, star like receptors that really dictate the outcome uh, of a, the recognition and cellular response. But the problem that, that, that my group and, and most other groups do is we tend to study things in isolation. We don't take into effect, into account that these receptors really work uh, in uh, multiple different uh, contexts and integrate their signaling with multiple different receptors. So this is something that we've been looking at for quite a few years now, and I'm going to show you some data that's quite old, but really highlight to you just how important this coordinated signaling uh, can be. Oops, well, let me press the slide there. Right. So we, we discovered uh, quite some years ago that uh, C-type lectin receptors, particularly lectin 1 in this example, can collaborate uh, with the tau like receptors to induce synergistic responses. And that's really very clearly exemplified uh, over here by this bit of data that we uh, published some years ago. So here basically is a, it's a macrophage uh, a cell line or a macrophage primary cell. I think in this case, this was the peritoneal macrophage. And if you take in uh, agonists of purified, pure, highly pure agonists with lectin 1, so this is a purified beta-glucan, or a purified toll agonist, uh, any mighty idea, a couple of toll agonists would do. This was LPS in this case, but you could use any other. And you can see that when you add these agonists individually to cells, you get a response or low responses. But if you add them together, you get the synergistic, more than additive response when you add them both together. So this really shows that these two signaling pathways are integrating, acting like an amplification step to drive uh, uh, inflammatory responses. Now, in many contexts, when you study pathogens, dissecting these collaborative responses uh, is very difficult because, of course, if you take a candida, for example, and you knock out dectin 1, you get reduced responses. If you take out a toll receptor, you can get reduced responses. So trying to understand this integration is not always immediately obvious. Uh, but one disease uh, has stood out where that was very obvious and which actually led to a, to a, to a cure, as I'll show you. So this is a disease that would be very familiar, or perhaps not familiar, but it's present in Brazil. Uh, it's very common in, in tropical and subtropical regions of the world. It's called chromoblastomycosis. It's a terrible disease. Um, it's caused primarily by this organism, but not completely, Francisea pedrosiae. So it's not a lethal uh, disease. It's not doesn't kill people. Uh, but it causes these chronic uh, skin infections that are almost impossible to treat and cure. Patients uh, generally undergo surgical resection for this, but you can imagine this is not really possible in instances like this. Uh, antifungal drugs don't really work very well. And so many years ago now, I had a Brazilian uh, student come to my lab to try and understand why does this disease chronic? Why does this disease occur? Why is the immune system defective in its ability to control it? Now, I, I didn't mention it, but it's a chronic disease. So these patients have it for, for, for decades, and it's, it's really unpleasant. So it turned out, uh, to cut a long story short, that what was happening was that Francisea pedrosia, we could show, was being recognized by the C-type lectin pathway. Uh, but, but for reasons that we don't fully understand, despite the fact that this organism did have toll-like receptors in its cell wall, the toll-like receptor pathway was not recognizing this organism sufficiently. And the reasons for that are, are unclear. But the take-home message from this, and this was done in a variety of in vitro and in vivo methods, the take-home message from this was that Francis Sayer was only being recognized by one arm of this very important immune system. And that although this was driving an inflammatory response, this was an insufficient response and led to the chronic nature of the disease. But the, the, the real cool thing about this is that once we understood this, we could then come in and, and exogenously trigger this pathway uh, to restore this robust inflammatory response. So we could add in exogenous agonists of the tolac pathway to try and uh, restore, as I say, the response and lead to clearance. And that's exactly what we found in our mouse model. So this is an, a, an intravenous a systemic mouse model, but we did the same thing with footpad models, for example. You can see very clearly that when you infect mouse with this organism, the organism persists and then persists for a very long time. It's chronic. It doesn't clear, but if you treat these animals now, if you stimulate this missing pathway, either interperitoneally or intravenously, it doesn't, doesn't matter. Um, you can restore the inflammatory response. So you see increased inflammatory responses if you measure cytokines, and this leads to pathogen clearance. Amazing, right? So understanding this one defect has allowed us to cure these animals of this infection. We went and re recapitulated that with a skin model, as I've just mentioned. And indeed, if you add topical agonists to the skin in these mouse models, they do exactly the same thing. They're, they're health clear. So the question, of course, was, well, can we do this in humans? So I collaborated with uh, several clinicians uh, in Brazil, Gil Bernard and others, 
um, we uh, in uh, Sao Paulo, we um, got hold of some some patients, and what we did was we treated these patients topically with a with a uh, toll agonist. There's an F. There's a drug that's already approved by the FDA called imiquimod. It's a toll agonist. And these patients, they topically applied uh, imiquimod to their lesions uh, every day for three months. And the, the dermatologists who were involved in this uh, study, Paolo Ricardo and others, were absolutely delighted with this. We tested this in four patients, and all four patients showed, as you can see in these pictures, an increasing inflammatory response that ultimately led to the resolution of the disease. So here was how a simple understanding of uh, the underlying immunology of a fungal infection could lead to a therapeutic cure. Now, there's several reports now in the literature about applying this approach to other patients, and all of them have been successful in curing the disease. Now, my one regret with this is that I've tried many times to get money together to try and do a proper clinical trial in Brazil. And with, with, uh, with Gil and others, we've set up all the cohorts and everything's ready to go. I just haven't been able to get money. Again, it's a very really difficult to raise money to try and uh, um, get people interested in, in curing this, but we're still working towards that with the idea that we could do a proper clinical trial and get that uh, accepted as a form of therapy uh, for these patients. So what about other pathogens? Can other pathogens do that? Uh, I'll just very briefly talk about some work that we're doing with Claire Hoving uh, in Cape Town. So Claire runs a lab uh, working on pneumocystis. So this is a one of those big four organisms I told you about. And so pneumocystis colonizes many of us, doesn't cause us any problems. You get HIV, AIDS, or other immune condi immune suppressive conditions cause a very nasty pneumonia that will kill you. Turns out that under immune compromised conditions, you need the adaptive immune response to, to drive robust inflammatory responses. And it turns out that this, this organism requires the adaptive response for exactly the same reasons that I've just described to you in chromoblastic mycosis, is that from the innate immune system, the, the pneumocystis just does not drive a robust inflammatory response in the context of immune suppression. And so if you take a mice, like a skid mouse that lacks an adaptive immune system, you get fungal outgrowth in the tissues, and you can actually completely cure this uh, pathogen uh, just by uh, adding a toll-like receptor agonist. So again, really highlighting just how important that these collaborative responses are in driving um, uh, protection. Now, one, one last point that I want to make about this uh, before I close, close my seminar. So it's great. In the context of infection, you need proper inflammatory responses to drive uh, uh, a cellular recruitment that leads to clearance of the pathogen. And I've just given you two examples of where that is absolutely critical for us to be able to control infection when we get it. But of course, robust inflammatory responses come with a negative aspect. They can drive pathology. They can cause damage. And that's something else uh, that we have been looking at. I'm just going to show you one old example now. We're constantly breathing in things like fungi and, and, and toll agonists. And we wondered whether these co-exposure of environmental evidence uh, agonists could also drive the same pathways I've just described, but actually, in this case, drive pathology. And we looked at this in the context of, of, of allergic responses, and that's exactly what we find. So you can see now, so if we administer mice with tile agonists or purified beta-glucan in this case, again, we see this synergistic inflamm inflammatory response occurring in the lungs of these animals. So this is measuring total cell numbers. And again, you can visualize that very clearly here uh, looking at the histology. Um, and if you looked at the individual agonists, it looks very similar to this. In other words, that these agonists will, will, can combine to drive robust inflammatory responses that in most settings can protect you against infection. But in some settings, such as in allergic responses, um, can actually exacerbate pathology. And if you're interested, you can go and have a look at those papers. But we basically went on to show that these co-stimulatory responses can actually drive steroid-resistant asthmatic responses uh, in the mice uh, that we uh, have studied. So um, that brings me to the end of my seminar. I wanted to just end off by pointing out to you that C-type lectins are incredibly fascinating. I focused my entire talk about their role in antimicrobial uh, uh, immunity, particularly around fungi. Of course, they play equally important roles in many other uh, pathogenic settings. They also play a role in homeostasis, as I alluded to at the beginning of my talk. But I hope I've convinced you of the three things that I set out to do, that these receptors are very important for regulating inflammation, but there are still things that we don't know about these receptors and still very exciting discoveries to be had. And finally, that these receptors actually work together with other receptors. And all that, although we largely study these molecules in isolation, it's important to think of the context in which they are playing and all the other receptors uh, that they are involved with. And it's this coordinated signaling that's really very important for 
the inflammatory response, whether it's both protective uh, or path uh, pathogenic. And then finally, just to thank uh, everyone who's been involved. So many of the people uh, listed here are people who've been involved or collaborating in many studies around the Aspergillus story, uh, Gil and Sandro around the chromoblastic mycosis story, and of course my group, the people of Blue are my current lab members who all contribute to all my stories. Um, and really the past members have also made significant contributions, our funders. And thank you for your attention. At this time, I'm happy to take some questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Brown, for the very inspiring uh, talk. Um, we have a, a couple of questions. Um, let's start with Dr. Uh, Patricia Martins from Osvaldo Cruz Foundation. Um, she says, uh, Dr. Brown, congratulations on your excellent talk. Uh, considering the importance of fibrosis to several chronic lung disease, I wonder whether MELAC receptor play a role in such class of disease? Very good question. We haven't really looked beyond aspergillus. Our primary focus now is really on understanding the mechanisms by which MELAC induces cellular responses and immunological responses. But absolutely, there's lots to be done. We haven't explored it in other contexts or even with other pathogens yet. So something to be done, indeed. Thank you for the question. Uh, we have another question from uh, Daniel Araujo. Um, he says, thank you and congratulations for your work. I would like to know if uh, CLRs have been described to play a role in mediating T. cruzy infections. So Daniel, thank you for the question. I, I think so. I'm embarrassed to say I can't remember off the top of my head. That's been, the c type lectins have played a lot of roles. I know it's certainly in Lishmania they've been played. Uh, trypanosome, I don't know. I think there are some papers, but off the top of my head, I apologize. I don't know them. I'd have to look it up. Sorry. Uh, there is a question here. I cannot see from Marina. Um, Marina Valente Barroso. Um, she's asking, do you intend to see the interaction uh, of MELEC uh, with other fungi, even those the ones without melanin? Thank you, Marina. No, we've looked. It seems to be very specific to melanin. So, for example, Canada, there's no role of MELEC in Canada, for example. Uh, we've looked at cryptococcus, which produces a melanin, but a different flavor of melanin, L-dopa-based melanin. It's not doesn't recognize those. It seems to be very specific for fungi that it recognizes DHN melanin phenotype. Uh, Marina has another question as well uh, uh, that I miss it. Um, she is asking, besides endothelial cells, do you think MELAC could be present in lung-specific cells? Could it have some other function in inflammatory response without fungal uh, stimulation? Good questions. We don't know, possibly. Uh, and the naive animals are otherwise completely normal, so we don't see any defects in these animals at all. Uh, I've mentioned to you we've tried some other models that doesn't seem to have a role. Is it present in lung-specific cells? So we've looked very extensively at which cell types it's expressed in many different tissues. We only see it on CD31 positive cells throughout the mouse. But in the lungs and livers, we see it on this very a unique population of C31 uh, EPCAM positive cells, these sort of joint cells, which most people, when they when they gate on, on, on um, epithelial cells and endothelial cells, they use these two markers. And you see very clear populations on both. I'm trying to get my, my hands to represent a, an axis. They see populations on both points, but there's always this cluster of cells that's there, and mostly it's ignored, actually. Uh, it's those cell types that seem to express this. We don't know what those cells are. Initially, we thought it might have been an artifact. Uh, we've just done recently done some uh, cell sorting of these cells, and they both express both markers. So what these are doing, we don't know yet, but we are looking at that. Um, we have another question from Genilda Castro de Omena Neto. Um, excellent talk, Dr. Brown. Uh, is your group considering evaluating the syn synergistic effect of lectins on the adaptive response to autoimmune disease? Um, no, so we've, I guess the closest we've come is not really an autoimmune disease, is allergic asthma. So we've definitely looked at the synergistic effect of lectins in that setting. Um, there are many groups who are looking at the role of lectins in, in things like arthritis. And in fact, one of the stories which I didn't present today, we have a receptor that inhibits the development uh, of arthritis. 
but we haven't really looked at synergism there. We have the problem with looking at the synergistic effect of molecules, like I've described, is actually breaking it up, up down. So we were very, I think the word lucky is probably not appropriate in this context, but the, the, the fact that this organism allowed us to dissect this pathway was very unusual. As I mentioned, if you look at something with a complex surface, it's very difficult to try and tease out the synergistic effect. But we haven't looked at, at autoimmune diseases, as you suggest. It's a good idea. I don't know if we will ever do it. You're welcome to. Uh, but we, we haven't really pursued that in any great detail. No. A question from Eduardo Duarte. Dr. Brown, thank you for sharing high quality science with us. Should do TLR treatment be acute or chronic? And what about the side effects, low grade inflammation and its consequences? Good point. So yes, so there is there is evidence, of course, that 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 Col7, which is what we're using in our in this therapy, can drive psoriasis. There is side effects for sure. But in the case of, of these patients, I think it seems to be very incredibly beneficial. We haven't really reported any side effects, to my knowledge, other than clearance of the pathogen after a, a, these short three-term um, experiments. All of the experiments that we've done have been done with topical administration, so on the skin, on these lesions. Uh, Claire and I have been talking about doing uh, intratracheal administration in mice of LPS. We've done that. That works. But of course, in humans, that would be a little bit more tricky. But there are actually... Um, other TLR agonists that have been tested in humans for various conditions in the lung that we are considering um, if we ever get to the translational aspect of the study. Uh, another question from Professor Rodrigo Figueiredo. Uh, Kitchen has been described to be recognized by uh, LISMD3 uh, receptor with a lysozyme domain, but it does not appear to have a signaling no domain. Uh, do you believe uh, Liz MD3 is a co-receptor for CLRs? So, good question. Um, chitin is an enigmatic molecule. Actually, there's many different receptors that have been described to be involved in recognizing it. I think the literature is a little bit unclear. Um, I don't know enough about the Liz MD3 receptor, to be honest, to be able to answer your question cognitively, but I would suggest that if it is actually a true chitin receptor, there could be interactions with things like the... Um, the Manos receptor, which has also been described to be a receptor for chitin, as have several TLRs. So I wouldn't be um, surprised if there is some sort of synergistic activity between receptors in recognizing chitin. But I think the full understanding of how chitin is recognized by the immune system is not fully resolved yet. It's been very complicated, mainly because chitin can become in acetylated and deacetylated forms. Different lengths have also been reported to have an effect. So to me, it's a bit of a gray area. It's not definitive yet. Um, another question for Professor Bruno Dias. Melec does also recognize melanin produced by, by melanocytes. Uh, this receptor may have a role in melanoma. Thanks, Bruno. Good question. Of course, I was really hoping for that because you could imagine the therapeutic consequences. But of course, uh, the melanin that we produce is a very different melanin. It's not recognized by this receptor. So we looked at that in quite some detail. But no, it's not recognized by melanin, unfortunately, because it would have been great if it had been. A question from Manuela Bastos. Uh, can C-lectin receptors interact with NETs, neutrophil extracellular traps, probably, in a, an inflammatory response? Absolutely. So this work that I collaborated on from Vinny, who's got this terribly long Greek surname that I can't pronounce, at the Crick Institute in London. So he's shown very clearly that C-type lectins can regulate NET formation. And in fact, uh, we've got a, a study that we're just working on with another receptor that I actually presented in one of my slides called Mikkel, myeloid inhibitory C-type lectin receptor. We've got good evidence that this receptor also regulates next formation, but not promoting it like lectin one, but repressing it. So yes, C-type lectin receptors definitely have a role in net formation. A question from Lucas Bolivi. Uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, understand that alternaria uh, species also produce DNH melanin and would activate MELAC your data show that deficient mice display unaffected T, uh, type 2 response uh, to, I don't think, I don't think uh, I get it. Well, I can, I can sort of anticipate okay. the question. Uh -huh. What you're going to ask, Lucas, is does alternaria play a role in the mice? Actually, that's a, that's a very good suggestion. So we, I've been very keen to look at alternaria because it does have DHN melanin. Um, it's very it's known to be um, very much involved in driving 
allergic responses. So what is the what is what is rolled as as malic having that? That's something we haven't got to yet. I would like to do it um, at the moment. As I say, our focus primarily has been on trying to understand how the hell this receptor is doing what it's doing. But that's something that I am intending to look at some point if somebody else doesn't do it before me. Yeah. Um, Mariana Renovato Martins, uh, excellent talk. And an inside out MIDI 88 can trigger such coordinating responses, integrating lectin receptors and TLR8 receptors, or the TLR receptor is needed? Um, I don't necessarily know what the question is there. Are you, yeah. perhaps you're asking how does the TOLAC receptors interact with the, with the C-type lectins? Well, there's definitely lots of evidence that there is, of course, regulation. Um, so uh, not the TOLAC receptors, I'm not necessarily familiar with them activating lectins per se, but certainly things like integrin. Um, are activated by lectins and vice versa. So there's definitely connected at the surface interactions, but I'm not necessarily certain what you're referring to, so I'm sorry, Mariana. No, actually, I'm... actually, she did a uh, comment uh, uh, below. Uh, she said, is, uh, if TLR is suppressed, should it have the same effect as MIDI 88 suppression? Yes. So, for example, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the result, the correlation between um, uh, the CLRs and the MIDI-88, uh, the, the TLRs, if we knocked out MIDI-88, we got the same effect as if we abs uh, lost the toll. So if there's a specific toll involved, absolutely, it has the same effect as loss of MIDI-88, indeed. Um, another question uh, from Louis, uh, Sergio Schmidt, actually, uh, I, uh, he says that he would be interested in uh, future work, perhaps, in the application of these findings regarding inflammation in the central nervous system. I mean, I don't know if you want to, to make some comments, Dr. Brown. Absolutely. So there's uh, several groups now that I know are working on uh, the role of, of Dectin-1 in, in, in CNS and Alzheimer's. So keep your eye out on the publications. There'll be some coming out, um, well, hopefully soon. Uh, we have a Question from Professor Marcelo Bosa. Uh, the amplification by TLRs and C-type lectins increase the sensitivity of the innate immune system to infection and damage. How frequent this amplifying system might also contribute to, the, to pathogenesis? Uh, inhibition of C could be a good strategy in these conditions. Yes, well, C unfortunately plays a very important role in many other functions as well. Um, I absolutely agree with you. I think the coordinated signaling and inflammation definitely plays a role in pathogenesis, probably in many settings, infection settings. But of course, it's a balance, right? Because you need ex exacerbated inflammation to drive the responses to, to clear their infection. I guess where that might come in is if there's delayed resolution or the resolution is altered. Uh, that might be a case. Second inhibition, I think, is quite complicated. They tend to be tested clinically. There are some side effects that are associated with it but certainly a possibility that could be considered. I mean, we haven't thought about going down that path at all, but certainly something to be con uh, keep in mind, yeah. Um, so I don't think we have, uh, we are done with the questions. I don't know if I missed it, some. So if I so, please, somebody tell me, but I think we are done. Um, so Dr. Brown, thank you very much for your presentation, for your inspiring talk. So uh, we hope that you could be here in Brazil, in Rio de Janeiro, in present uh, to interact with us. But unfortunately, uh, it's not possible at this moment. I think we got one more question, and I think we can uh, end after that. Uh, it's from Mateus Werner. Uh, it's known that innate receptors can also recognize danger signals influencing the immune response. Have you experienced in your work, a dangerous signal interacting with MELAC receptors? Matthias, good question. Of course, there's endogenous ligands for all of these receptors, I'm pretty sure of it. And we just have to look for it. We haven't really looked yet for MELAC uh, endogenous, and they're much more difficult to find if there are any. So I'm, I'm, I wouldn't be surprised if there is one, but we haven't found it or have started looking for it yet. But thank you for the question. Okay. So I think we are done. So again, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Brown. Um, just want to remind uh, the audience, the students, professors, researchers, 
uh, that we're going to have uh, an, uh, the next session is on Friday. Uh, and we hope to see all there. Okay, thank you very much. And you have a good afternoon. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.